Hey everyone, Christopher Paolini here, and I am doing what has become an annual tradition of signing these tip-in sheets for Barnes & Noble. Uh, these sheets will be bound into some editions of Aragon, which will be available over the holidays, and I'll be sure to uh, tweet and uh, post about that on social media, so if you want to grab a signed copy of Aragon, you certainly can. I've already signed some here on the right, don't think these are visible, but you can get the idea here. And uh, I'm going to be uh, answering some questions as I, <laughs> as I sign these. And uh, I, I had my assistants put out a, a call for questions on social media, and you blew me away by the number of um, responses. So I'm going to answer as many of them as I can uh, in these videos here. And uh, before I get to that, I wanted to show you something cool that showed up. This is the Japanese edition of To Sleep in a Sea of Stars. And yes, they split it into two volumes because uh, when... English is translated into Japanese, it's often longer, and To Sleep in a Sea of Stars is a very long book to start with. So <laughs> in combination, uh, these three books uh, have about 1,700 pages in them. So it's a big, big story in Japanese. And the cool thing is, I'll show you the, here's the cover for the first book. And I don't know how well this is gonna show up, but when you put all the covers together, they actually form a single image, which is really, really cool. And each one of the books has different, uh, different colored M papers. They do a wonderful job. My Japanese publishers do a wonderful job of uh, packaging the books in a beautiful, beautiful way. So anyway, I really like these. I wanted to show them off. And uh, I'm going to be getting uh, questions from my awesome assistant, Emanuela. So uh, Emanuela, you want to start us off with a, with a fun question? Yes. We have a question from Lyle on Facebook. He wants to know, what is a real world example of beer that you think Aragon and friends would drink? I'm a home brewer and would love to do an Aragon inspired brew one day. <laughs> Funny thing is uh, my dad's actually made some beer at home uh, many years ago, but uh, it was, boy, it was good. Uh, beers that the characters would enjoy. I think it would depend on the characters. If we're talking about Aragon and Roran, than probably an ale or a lager, something rich, dark, uh, lots of flavor. Those are also happen to be my personal preferences. Uh, if we're talking about Murtag, he would probably scorn beer altogether and go for you know something more sophisticated like wine. Uh, if we're talking about Auric or the Dwarves, then they would definitely go for mead, which um, would suit them. But if we had to pick like just one beer in general, uh, the darker, the richer, the better. Not something too sweet, though, you know, and not something too hoppy. Nice, rich, mellow, you know, something something that you can drink after a long day out in the, working in the fields. You have some bread, you have your beer, whatever else. It'll keep you on the feet working for another 10 hours. Our next question is from at Madugoes on Instagram. Forgive me if I mispronounced that. Can you tell us any curiosities or fun facts about Fiernan's time growing up with Arya? Uh, Fiernan is incredibly mischievous and gets into lots of trouble, or got into lots of trouble, <laughs> by uh, flying into all the different uh, tree houses of the elves and rummaging around and causing a mess. Basically, baby dragons are like, you know, if you've ever had a puppy or a kitten, they're like that, but worse, because they can fly. and maybe breathe some little sparks, which is a, which is a matter of concern when you are uh, living in a treehouse. The next question is from at Essie underscore Schneider on Instagram. What did Angela whisper to the priest? My brother and I have been theorizing for a decade. Well, she told the priest who she actually is. And if that doesn't scare you, nothing will. Uh, it's, it's, aside from that, I'll have to say no comment because... That would be uh, spoilers for future stories. But uh, if you haven't read To Sleep in a Sea of Stars, uh, you would find a little piece of extra information in that book that might help you answer that, that question. Sean on Facebook wants to know, how will the new Rider Magic Pact affect the dwarves and Urgles? We know it makes the humans more elf-like. Will that happen to the dwarves and Urgles as well? Well, it's only going to affect them over... A long period of time so there isn't necessarily an immediate effect it's the sort of thing that takes 
you know, generations to really show its effect. Well, or if not generations, the individuals who are affected need to live a very long time with that pact to start to feel <clears throat> that magic changing them. Uh, I would say with the, the Urgles, uh, it's likely to make them perhaps a little less aggressive, a little more social. Uh, I don't know if it's going to give them pointed ears or not. Uh, <laughs> maybe it'll affect the growth of their horns. Uh, for the dwarves, dwarves are already fairly social. Um, it might also make them a little less aggressive, but you know they're not a, you know they're not as aggressive as the the urgles. Um, but it very well might give them pointed ears also. Uh, that's the effects of that uh, spell is something that I want to explore in some future stories. So, uh, but again, it's going to take a lot of time to really see what it's doing to the different races. Sean on Facebook wants to know. Anything more you can tell us about the wounded soldier who saw the lights? <laughs> uh, not particularly. Uh, we may see more of him, but uh, since energy is uh, almost a physical slash tangible thing in the world of Aragon, and we there, there are a lot of descriptions in the series where Aragon is seeing the flow of energy with his mind, and it's usually described in terms of light, and of course we have the spirits also. I thought it would be interesting if, you know, there was a magical side effect, so to speak, or, you know, an effect where someone could actually visualize the flow of energy around them, almost as if you were able to see, you know, electromagnetic uh, lines of force or UV or something like that. Uh, but no, I haven't forgotten that character, and uh, it certainly would be interesting to write about him or use him in a story. I think he definitely has a, a unique perspective and it's gonna lead his life in a completely different direction from where he was originally going. At sandeepk.24 on Instagram wants to know, does prophecy change with your true name? Since Aragon was a different person when he went to Angela and the true name would definitely have changed by the time he left Alagazia, so maybe he could actually return back once in a while? Well, aren't you clever? Prophecies are not set in stone. They're, they're more of suggestions than anything. Sometimes they come to pass, sometimes they don't. The further out that a prophecy ranges, that is the further into the future it goes, the more likely it is to, uh, it more likely actual events are to diverge from that path. So as for the prophecy, as it relates to Aragon, I mean, Aragon has certainly left Alagazia. Whether or not he will ever be able to return there or will choose to return to Alagazia is something you will have to wait for future stories to find out. From Leandra on Facebook. Are they thinking live action or animation for the new Disney Plus series of Aragon? Either way, I'm going to watch, but I think they'd be able to capture more via animation. Great question, uh, and I, I certainly understand where you're coming from. Uh, the plan at the moment is for a live action television show. And one of my great concerns when I was having discussions with Disney and Fox Television, which is uh, the ones actually producing and getting this off the ground, one of my, my biggest concerns was A, you know, can I be involved? Will I have a say? Can I help make this as good as possible? And B, uh, is it even possible to do what needs to be done on a television budget? Uh, you know, 10, 20 years ago, the answer would have been no, absolutely not. But times have changed. The technology has changed, and it's changing very rapidly. You know, with uh, a lot of the stuff they've been able to do for the Star Wars shows, and of course now for the Percy Jackson show, uh, they, they seem confident that they can do this, that we can have Safira as a main character and that uh, all of the stuff that needs to be in the story can be in the story. Now, again, we're in early days. Uh, things may change. I can't make any definitive promises. A lot will depend on the budget the show gets and uh, <laughs> exactly what's in the script. But I do think it is possible to do live action, and we're going to do our best to make it as good as possible. And that's not to downplay animation, because I love animation. I'm a huge fan of Miyazaki and... Studio Ghibli and a bunch of other animated films, and I agree with you that an animated version of Aragon could be wonderful and awesome, but uh, this particular adaptation is going to be live action. From Oliver on Facebook, 
Good evening to you, fine sir. I'm Oliver from Ireland. My question is in regards to the upcoming Aragon TV show on Disney+. Plus. Is the show going to be focused on more of a younger audience or an adult audience? I think we're actually going to be aiming a little bit older. Uh, that's not to say this is going to suddenly turn into Game of Thrones and there will be gratuitous uh, nudity and violence left and right because that would not suit this story. But... I feel, and uh, everyone involved in the project definitely seems to feel also, that to do this properly, uh, Aragon himself and the story needs to be treated seriously. And there are some very serious things that happen in the story. I've seen people on Twitter bringing up a few of them and mentioning, you know, gee, I wonder how they can do this if it's going to be, you know, PG or something like that. I don't think it's going to be PG in the slightest. Um, the the film was pg it was actually filmed as pg-13 and then in editing they cut it down to pg and you really notice that in the battles you know things don't cut right you know someone swings a sword and then it gets really choppy because they don't want to show you the sword impacting and landing that won't be the situation with the television show or that's my understanding at least so uh i think as i said we will be aiming a bit older we will be trying to treat the story seriously but at the same time uh, I feel it's very important to keep a sense of innocence uh, with Aragon, uh, a sense of earnestness, uh, a sense of uh, sincerity. I wrote the books in a sincere fashion, and I hope this show and series will also feel sincere and not cynical. Ah, that's a good motto. Sincere, not cynical. From Norbert underscore Godforest on Instagram. How large of a role will you play in co-writing the Aragon series? Does your opinion have a big impact on the film set? Uh, well, I'm again at the beginning of this process, so uh, ask me in a few, ask me in a year, and I can maybe give you a more thorough answer. However, uh, I am going to be executive producing and co-writing the show, so uh, the idea is that uh, the folks that I'm working with seem to want me involved, and I want to be involved. And there have been some very good examples in Hollywood of creators being involved with adaptations of their material and that working out well for everyone involved. And uh, the, the team I'm working with is, is very aware that uh, the fandom was not enthusiastic about the previous adaptation and that we need the fandom to be enthusiastic about this adaptation in order for it to be a success. So uh, I am going to have my fingers in every aspect of this uh, as much as possible, uh, both as time and ability allow. From Susanna on Facebook, are you anticipating a lot of changes from book to screen, or are you trying to go as book accurate as possible? Well, I mean, ideally it's as book accurate as possible, but it, that's, that's impossible to, I mean, you can't have a one-to-one -one translation from a book to a film or a television show. Absolutely impossible. Uh, one of the biggest reasons, aside from pacing reasons, one of the biggest reasons is that books allow you to show someone's thoughts directly. You know, you can get right inside someone's head, Aragon's head, Safira's head, and we can directly understand what they're feeling, what they're thinking, and what makes them tick. With television and with film, you are stuck on the outside of the character, and that necessi that means that certain changes are just inevitable. You have to find ways to dramatize and show what's going on in those in those characters um, and that's where me pairing with you know a showrunner and co-writer who is that which will be the same person uh, who has a lot of experience will be helpful because I've learned a lot about screenwriting but it's also not been my main profession and working with someone who has a lot more experience will uh, hopefully allow us to really do justice to the story so yeah there will certainly be changes but my hope is that all those changes will be ultimately to serve the, you know, the feel of the characters in the world as they are in the books. From Karen on Facebook. Just found out I got COVID. One thing that would really make me feel better is an approximate date for your next book. I'll take a season even if that's all you can provide. Definitely in need of a new book. Uh, Karen, so sorry you hear, to hear you got COVID. Uh, I had it earlier in the year, and it was not fun. Not the worst thing in the world, but not fun. Uh, as far as dates, my publishers will hate me if I give any dates, because uh, publishers really like to uh, make a big announcement when they actually have a release date. However, 
Uh, as I said in my public statement about the Disney Plus show, uh, I do have two books that hopefully will be coming out next year. I'm in the middle of editing, editing on both of them right now. Uh, one is a science fiction novel uh, set in the fractal verse. It's actually set before To Sleep in a Sea of Stars. And the other one has dragons in it. So make of that what you will, but you shouldn't have to wait too long to get some more books from me. From Andres on Facebook. I've been a fan since childhood and To Sleep in a Sea of Stars is my favorite book as an adult. Now that your writing has gone galactic, do you think we'll ever get a full world map of the planet that Allegasia is on? Ah, oh, what a great question. Um, will we ever get a full planetary map of Allegasia? Possibly. It's not something I've uh, done. And I'll tell you why. It's because there's so much that needs doing in my life with the writing and editing and all sorts of other things that I usually only do pieces of art when, you know, I have a book coming out that needs illustrations. So uh, my time is so limited that I don't usually just doodle around and do stuff for the fun of it, which I miss, quite honestly. Uh, but no, it would be fun to do a planetary map of Allegasia. Um, actually, you've got me thinking about that now. <laughs> maybe, maybe I will work that up, uh, even if it's just as a sketch for myself. Uh, I did uh, actually a drawing uh, for f the Fork, the Witch, and the Worm that did not end up in the book, and it was a drawing of Mount Arngor, where the Dragon Rider academy training facility is being put together by Aragon and the elves. And uh, I really liked that drawing, but I wasn't able to finish it off in time to get in the book. So that's one I need to, I need to do. Uh, for my most recent science fiction book, which should be coming out next year, I actually did six, six new drawings, uh, which was a lot of fun. Paintings, actually, not just drawings, paintings. From Nathan on Facebook. Will there be more Fractalverse novels? Also, will there eventually be an illustrated guide slash lore book? Ooh, well, uh, there will certainly will be lots more Fractalverse books. That's the whole idea of the Fractalverse, is I can write lots of different types of stories in it over the years. And uh, Emanuela, can we, can we spoil a little bit of what we've been working on this year? Yeah, okay. So uh, it's not quite a lore book, but uh, I wrote a... Uh, interactive story set after To Sleep in a Sea of Stars. It's a novella, which is currently available for free on my website, fractalverse.net. Uh, the title of the story is Unity, and I had a lot of fun writing that. Uh, but I think most of my readers don't actually know it exists. So my team and I, uh, mostly uh, Emanuela, has been, uh, we've been putting the book together as a print version which should be available later this year. And it's absolutely gorgeous. Full color art. Um, uh, we've commissioned more art for it. Uh, just a lot of fun stuff in there. So that's, that's actually going to be very close to a lore book. Uh, and then with each new book in the Fractalverse, I hope to build out more and more of the mythos and uh, the history of this alternate version of reality because there's a lot going on in it and to sleep in a sea of stars actually just kind of scratch the surface in a bunch of ways in fact i'm hoping with some of these future books that you'll read them and you'll look back at to sleep in a sea of stars and you'll go oh so that's what was going on <laughs> from nathan underscore j on instagram is there still a movie in the making for to sleep in a sea of stars uh, so the adaptation is still in the works. Great question, by the way. Uh, I talked about this recently in a German interview, but I don't think I've talked about it here to a, my more general audience. Uh, but yes, the adaptation is still in the works. It's shifted gears. It's no longer a film. It's We're now aiming at television, and that's because the film script that was produced was, everyone said it was a good, we did a good job with it, but it was just too much crammed into too little. You know, uh, the, we, we, had, we lost too much of the characters and too much of the actual events of the book trying to cram everything down to, you know, a two, two and a half hour movie. We always knew, I always knew that was a risk, but I still thought it was possible. <laughs> um, but it was, a, it was a learning experience. So, uh, no, we're, we're currently working toward a television adaptation with our producing partners. And I have written a couple of scripts for them, pilot and second episode so far. 
And anything more than that, I don't think I can say it right now. But the adaptation is not dead, just moving slowly. But it's Hollywood's one of those places where, as with many industries, things move very, very slowly, 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 and then it happens all at once. And so you have to do a lot of planning and a lot of talking and a lot of meetings and a lot of revisions to get to the point where things all of a sudden start happening very fast. Just as with the... Uh, this Disney Plus adaptation of Aragon, you would be shocked to know how long negotiations were going on before we were able to actually talk about it publicly. Abigail on Facebook wants to know, what happened to Kira's team? Last we know, the ones that survived were okay, but... Uh, they, the rest of Kira's team were taken off to First 61 Signy and Viborg Station, and then they were evacuated from 61 Signe and were taken back to the solar system. So uh, they're still around, they're still alive, but Kira just doesn't, you know, meet or interact with them in To Sleep in a Sea of Stars, which is actually something that changed in revisions. In one of the earlier versions of the books, I had some of her old teammates uh, actually contacting Kira when she was at 61 Signe, and that just changed because the whole shape of the, the the last three quarters of the book changed in revisions. From at Kyle underscore Rhodes underscore Potter on Instagram, how did you conceptualize the alien ships into Sleep in a Sea of Stars? Ooh, what an interesting question. Uh, I just wanted stuff that was different. Uh, and and part of it was thinking about, uh, for example, with the, the jellies, the Renawi, uh, thinking about their genetic and cultural background and the fact that they are a water-dwelling species, or that's how they originated. And so thinking about things that were spherical and that would work well for conveying large amounts of liquid, which they often do, so that they have a home environment with them. Uh, and then also just thinking, again, how technology influenced them. And then there are also the nightmares, which, honestly, that I just ran with the imagery of tumors and cancer. So that, <laughs> that, that's what dominated there. Um, but the base technology uh, that allows for space travel is the same between the humans and the jellies. Uh, the rest is all cultural and species-specific decisions. From Goldie on Facebook. Honestly, I have about a hundred questions, but I wanted to know what advice you would give to aspiring fantasy and sci-fi writers out there. That could be the topic of an hour-long conversation. But I think the big ones that I've learned and, you know, through making my own mistakes would be doing everything you can to be consistent with your world and spending time really thinking about what differentiates your world from the real world, whether you have magic that changes, you know, what's possible or technology <laughs> that changes what's possible, uh, religions, cultures, uh, all of that will change who your characters are and how they view the world. So those are the things I would really think about. Um, and then more generally, and this is something that every writer of fiction has to deal with, I would spend a lot of time thinking about plot and character and how they interact. It's, it's easy sometimes to get caught up in other aspects of writing and think, oh, I know what I'm doing, I know what I'm doing, I'll figure it out on the page. Sometimes you can, I usually can't. I really need to do my prep work. And uh, that, that helps me, that helps me a lot. Also, if you're writing science fiction or fantasy, I say keep track of all your names, places, things, rules of magic, write them down somewhere, and that will help you be consistent. And it'll also give you ideas for the future when you can see everything all put together. From Danae on Facebook, are you planning to make any more writing tip videos on YouTube? <laughs> I would love to make more writing tip videos, but uh, my time has gotten very tight over the past year or so. So uh, we'll see. Um, that's part of why I'm doing this video, these Q and A, this Q and A right now, is to get some more content out. But uh, if the choice is between getting my editing done or my writing done and or doing a video, I know which one I'm going to choose. Uh, you know, being a YouTuber or social media personality really is a full-time job, as I've come to appreciate. And uh, my focus ultimately is in produ on producing these books. So, uh, yes, I would like to produce more writing tip videos, but <laughs> maybe once I get done with the editing, the current editing. And the, and the cool thing is, is 
I know I'm learning things now that will give me new topics to talk about. So, you know, that's, that's the other thing is it's, it's a never ending process of, uh, education. From at Sarah Francis dot Jones on Instagram, what would you say is slash are your interesting writing quirks? Ooh. Um, I mean, I, I tend to really personalize MS Word, which is what I write in. So I do a lot of things to change how the program looks and how the text looks. Uh, these days, I really prefer a black background with green text that uh, is easy on my eyes. I, I program in a lot of key combos for track changes and other things just to make things as easy and streamlined as possible. Um, I don't know. I mean, writing is so personal. I don't know. I don't know what qualifies as a quirk and what just qualifies as how I work. Uh, I do like plotting and world building in notebooks, uh, writing by hand. Uh, I've even done some work on typewriters. I have two typewriters sitting here out of frame. Um, I like writing with music or sounds of nature. I find that very helpful. Uh, I like M dashes, semicolons, parentheses, ellipses, and all other forms of punctuation. And I'm a big believer in the Oxford comma. And this is a follow-up question from at Minnesota underscore LG on Instagram. How many notebooks do you think you have had and currently have since your writing career began? Both finished and unfinished? Uh, well, I have an entire shelf of notebooks over by my desk over there, my writing desk. And it's literally a full shelf with a couple of notebooks stacked on top of uh, the rest of them. And I have filled about this many notebooks, if that's visible on camera. Yes, it's visible on camera. I've filled about that many notebooks with handwriting. So uh, I have showed this off before. I do have one monster notebook. This is the Godzilla of notebooks. <clears throat> Give me a second here. Ah! This is a notebook. And I think you can see how thick it is and it's hand tooled. And the problem is, is it's so big that I can't really uh, fill a whole page comfortably. So I divide the pages up into two columns. And let me see if I can get this to show. So that's, so I have to divide up the pages like that and then I'm able to write comfortably. I don't know if I'm ever gonna finish this sucker because there are so many pages and they're so big, but it sure is fun to write in it. From at Arian Lynn Freer on Instagram, how on earth did you become a Scottish Laird? <laughs> uh, it was a gift from my friend. Uh, there's, I'm sure you've heard of this. There's a, a company or companies where you can basically buy a tiny, tiny, tiny sliver of land over in Scotland, and that technically allows you to claim to be a, a Scottish lord. So my friend thought it would be enormously funny to, to get this for me and register me as a Scottish lord. It wasn't, wasn't something I ever planned on doing. So I have somewhere my official card with all the registry information on it and saying that I'm the Scottish Lord. But um, yes, Laird Christopher Paolini. Uh, it, it, it amuses me, even though I know it's absolutely uh, means nothing, but it amuses me immensely. From at Caden Prodden on Instagram, who was the most difficult character for you to write and the most easy? I mean, the easiest, especially back in the day, was Aragon, because he was very similar to me in a lot of ways. And the hardest one was uh, probably Arya mainly because the furthest thing from a 15-year-old homeschooled boy in Montana is a 100-year-old female elven princess. Is in To Sleep in a Sea of Stars, I think uh, the main character, Kira, was actually very tricky for me because she was in a very different place in her life than Aragon was. You know, she's not an adolescent. She's not growing up in the same way. So figuring out what her story was and what her journey was uh, gave me a bit of Gave me a bit of trouble, but I, I figured it out. From at Geraldine underscore GWS on Instagram. How is fatherhood? Would love some updates about the little one. Uh, fatherhood's amazing. It, it certainly gives you perspectives on life that even if you intellectually knew them beforehand, uh, perhaps you don't feel them uh, in the same way until you actually have a child of your own. So it really has changed how I look at 
a lot of things in the world. There's some things it hasn't changed, and that it actually surprised me. But uh, he is a joy and a delight and gives me a reason to get up every morning and, and push harder and try to be a better version of myself. So fatherhood's good. It's a lot of work. Uh, it's as much work as everyone ever tells you it is, but uh, I'm very happy being a father.